Alors. <笑>好美啊真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的真的
the auspicious date was the 13th of the bright half of the month of Chaitra. Oh, Indu month, okay. <laughs> we have too many calendar, and now they have to include my calendar as well. <laughs> we have one extra calendar. I'm good at calendar. I don't just read. I give you big, long <laughs> explanation and every other thing. <laughs> it become a calendar. And I hope I'll be famous as a calendar maker. <laughs> special, <laughs> special calendar. <laughs> so the moon was in conjunction with the Uttara Paguni Nasasastra, okay, <laughs> meaning lunar mansion the sign of victory. At that auspicious moment, Mother Trisla gave birth to a divine child. The child was the embodiment of divine light. As soon as uh, he was born, the world was filled with radiant light. It appeared as if to behold this divine light, even the blind were blessed with eyes. Such a radiant light, such brightness, that as if the blind people could even see, so bright. Yes. Maybe the blind people could see also, if that light were not just outside, but also infused in the beings on this planet, then people can even see the light inside. Yeah. Also, so in case this light was so bright and so benevolent, full of blessing from the great master, you know, the newborn master, that the beings on this planet at that time might have been infused, blessed to see their own light within. Maybe not too long, maybe for a moment, yeah? Because this is the birth of a great master. So heavens and all the Buddhas are saying the past, present, uh, master, they all blessing the whole planet, you know, in joy and celebration. Thus even the blind could see. That's what people think at that time. It was possible that the blind have seen something. Yeah, in our group, in our association, there were some members, they were blind. But during the time of initiation and henceforth, they were able to see things, you know, the inside, yeah. So they said, oh, I can see this, I can see that. <laughs> so that's why uh, in the Bible, it is stated that Jesus made the blind see, yeah. In the Buddha's time also, everything is possible. This light penetrated even the oppressive, dense darkness of the hell. Wow! So the hell beings forgot their pain, their quarrels, their fight, and battles stopped. In hell, so there are a different kind of hell, yeah? There are hell when people are burned or chopped or punished in so many gruesome ways. And there's some hell, the people keep fighting like forever, you know, like they were fighting uh, when they were alive already, and when they die, they continue fighting in hell. Whatever they have not finished on this planet, they continue in the astral level, or in hell level, it's similar. So make sure whatever you quarrel with your wife or husband, finish it, yeah, <laughs> before you die. <laughs> You might continue fighting elsewhere, and I'm not responsible. Okay, this is personal, private business. <laughs> it's not my job huh, to interfere. So all the battles, you know, in hell, or maybe between hell and heaven also stopped then. Mm. Wow, there should be more master keep being born, eh? <laughs> and then peace will, will reign on earth and everywhere. Though suffering, from a lifetime of hunger and thirst, experienced a divine feeling of fulfillment. All around, cool and fragrant breeze started blowing. Patients of chronic ailments 
felt cured, yeah, even healed the diseased. Yeah. Natural enemies too had a surge of a feeling of mutual goodwill and love. All the three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell, were filled with waves of happiness. With the birth of the child, the whole atmosphere underwent a strange change for quite some time. Ah, isn't that wonderful? Mm. Hearing the news of the birth of Lord Mahavir Swami, Swami is the title of somebody who renounced the world, become monk, okay? Yeah. He was just born, and they, uh, I mean, just for respectful uh, addressing, they call him already Mahavir Swami, because as you know, later he will renounce the whole kingdom, everything, and went on to be an ascetic, renunciate, a monk. Hearing the news of the birth of Lord Mahavir Swami, uh, at that time the whole kingdom did not know that he will become a Swami yet. Actually, Swami in India, they address to people who has no more attachment to the world, not necessarily the monk, yeah. But mostly, it is addressed to monks or nuns, yeah, Swami, yeah. Uh, just a title in Sanskrit means monk. Uh, but they address him first for respect, yes. Now, all the inhabitants of the dimensions of gods danced with joy. Even the gods in heaven were dancing with joy. I didn't know they could dance in heaven. <laughs> Do they have music <laughs> like cha-cha-cha or something? <laughs> First of all, the kings of God, Sakrendra, is means Sakra, is similar, okay? Short is Sakra, long is Sakrendra. I mean, that uh, God who always tries to make trouble for the Buddha and other practitioners. In other story I told you, remember? I don't know. Don't remember. Okay, I remember. That's good enough. I remember for all of you. So many stories about Sakra, and you don't remember him? You should. Mm, because he's very, very troublesome guy. Yeah. When you like sincerely vow that, oh, I'm going to save all being in hell, or all being on the planet, or being on the universe, then he'll come, pay you a visit. And what a visit, you know, right? <laughs> He's going to make a lot, of, a lot of suffering and trouble for you. See if you really are sincere, really devoted for your goal, or this selfless, sacrifice for others or not. Or just a little test, just a little test, and then you give up. Little test for him, <laughs> but for us, <laughs> poor, <laughs> poor practitioner is hell, excuse me. You know already, huh? Many stories I told you. And then come some more, some more from this story, just to remind you in case you forgot him. Don't ever forget this guy, okay? <laughs> if he come near, you immediately recite the five names, pray to all the master in the world, in the other world, <laughs> to, to help you, protect you quickly. Otherwise, you will be become a thousand pieces before you, you can even <laughs> uh, recite anything or become Buddha or anything. This is very scary, this guy. So, uh, uh, the king of the gods. Not, not God, big God, but small God, you know, like the kings of divas. I don't know why they call everybody God like that. Should be only one God, you know, but these are smaller gods. So we can call them divas, but they call themselves gods like that. This is in India, so they translate it like that. You must know, this is not almighty God, okay? Just a small, small God, yeah. It's just like there is a big king who have a control over many small kingdoms, and they, they call him also king, or maybe Maharaji, mean great king, and other is just Raja, I mean small king, but still king. So the king of God came, he came, personally came and bowed before the Lord, and then circle, mumble later, 
Mother Trishla three times. I mean, walking slowly around. Uh, if you circumambulate someone, that means you have utmost respect, just like circumambulate the Buddha when he was alive or any other saints, you know, in the old time tradition like that. And they also bow to the Buddha with the forehead, touch their feet, uh, or the saint or their master, to show uh, the most respectful uh, gesture. So he circumambulate the mother even, the uh, Queen Trisla, three times. Sometimes they do it seven times, it depends. All the gods, goddesses, and lower gods, is still lower than this god, I mean, like a Gandhava, uh, Kina, etc., sang and danced and celebrated the birth of uh, the Tirthanka with gaiety, with, with joy, yeah. Gandhava, do you know, yeah, right? I told before, no? If I'm not wrong, he's a god of music, yeah? One of them uh, incarnated in Vietnam in the recent years. He passed away already. That's why his music is so touching and catchy. Every song, I liked it very much. Mm. According to the, uh, the Kalpa Sutra, on the night of the birth of the child, first of all, 56 divine maidens from all directions, their title is Disha Kumaris in Sanskrit. They came uh, from all directions and performed the first cleaning and other necessary post-birth duties. Sakrendra and other gods then took the child to the peak of the Meru mountain and gave him the first bath and anointment. They sang songs in honor of the divine child. You know Mount Meru? In India, it's supposed to be very sacred. It's often mentioned in the Buddhist sutra. Like the Buddha would go to Mount Meru, you know, and preach something or do contemplation up there. It belongs to the Himalaya ranch, okay? Uh, at dawn, a maid named Priyamvada rushed to King Siddhartha and announced. The king did not know yet, because the birth was in the night. Perhaps uh, the queen wasn't in the palace. Uh, at night, they close the gate and everything, or, and then it's, they have to take care of the child and the mother first. And <laughs> the goddess uh, brought the child to Miru Mountain to bless him and bathe him. It must be frozen there, oh, very cold. <laughs> On top of the mountain, Himalaya, bath a little kid, a little baby. <laughs> but they are different, they are divine people, so probably he won't feel any cold. So this maid named Priyamvada rushed to the king Siddhartha and announced, Congratulations, sire. Many congratulations. Queen Trisla has given birth to a male child. Sire, you know, right? Like, sir. But uh, they use sire for king only. Uh, for other higher people or respected people, they say sir. But for king, sire. Mm. So, Filled with joy and ecstasy, the king gave away all the ornaments on his body, except the, uh, the state emblems. He gave everything that on his body at that time to the mate Priyamvada. He was too happy, too joyful, because he already heard so much about his son before the birth. Yeah, it's, it's a great son is coming even, and to have a son to continue his reign. This is auspicious enough already not to talk about such a divine, great and auspicious son as that. So he was overjoyed and he took everything from his, <laughs> except the, the one that represents the state and the, king, the kingship. He gave everything to their mate. He was too happy. <laughs> Normally a king <laughs> doesn't do that. <laughs> 
And you know, it must be very, very precious thing that he has given to this maid. King, they don't wear just a, I don't know, it's just this, like me. He would wear jewelry, huh? Diamond and, and rubies and lapis lazuli, whatever, you know, the best in the kingdom and the best and the biggest and the, the most flawless jewelry that he would wear on his body as a symbol of uh, authority and wealth. Kings in the old time, they, they wear jewelry, yeah? Sometimes they wear the long pearl also or long uh, chain, long necklace of jewelry or something on their head their body, yeah, and their wrist or their finger. Imagine, he took all that out and gave it to the maid <laughs> because they're too happy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wouldn't you wish you were the maid at that time, huh? <laughs> then you don't have to work very hard in loving hood anymore. <laughs> Just go enjoy the life of a luxury. <laughs> he also released her from slavery. Wow, even, yeah. Thus, a slave woman was free of her lifelong slavery just because she was the bearer of the good news of the birth of the Tathanka. She just came and told the news, that's it, and she became free of her slavery and got so much jewelry from the king. She could live the whole life long with her family without doing anything anymore because of this precious jewelry that the king gave. Imagine that. Uh, the child just born and everybody profit already. The maid already became rich and free, just like that. Why does the king need to free her? You should know, in the old time, people sell themselves or they are sold as slaves eh? for life long, to pay for debt or just to get some money to live by, you know, by the, for the family. Because the poor people, when they have children, sometimes they cannot raise them because they don't have enough money or some circumstances. And they sold their children as a slave. And that will be a lifelong. You will never be free from slavery. Or maybe if you have a lot of money or somebody bought you out, then possible, yes, but it's not always possible like that, yeah. It's very, very special cases. And even if you have money, you want to buy the slave free, not necessarily the owner, soccer owner, would sell it because he or she might like the mate so much or the slave so much, they don't want to sell. And they have money, why they bother to sell? They don't need money and they like the mates, they like the slaves, so they won't sell you. Uh, talking about old time, in America, a few hundred years ago, 200 some years ago, still have this kind of trade, you know, of slavery. Nowadays, we don't have that. Maybe in some areas still have. Imagine 21st century, people still sell and buy others, look exactly like me and you, still sell and buy them like a, a pen or something, like a, an object. This is not correct. Maybe this system don't exist officially anymore, but it still exists in some poor area, rural area, and it's uh, regrettable. Uh, and even then, if we abolish this kind of slavery trade forever, we still must consider the animal slavery trade as well. They are also beings, they have feeling, they have emotion, they have intelligence, they have loyalty to each other, and they are so good to each other and to humans also. And we sell, buy, sell, buy them just like we did with humans before. That's also not correct. Our world is not correct in many ways. I don't know how long it takes to change all this, but we will have to change it. And we are doing all we can to change this system because it's not right. There's only one way to do things, it's the right thing. And this thing is not right. No matter what country or what government, if they have some thinking, yeah, 
some little sympathy in the heart, some understanding of what's right, what's wrong, then this slavery of humans and animals should be abolished long, long time before I was even born. That should be the right thing to do. And we hope it comes soon. Now, <laughs> the prince was born, so of course they're going to celebrate, eh? And they're going to describe to us the celebrations of this great being called Mahavira. King Siddhartha called his prime minister and ordered thus, I tell the officer in charge of celebrations to organize unique and special birth celebrations. After the king's order, all the highways rose and lanes in the town of Kastriyakund were cleared. Perfumed water was sprayed and bunting gallons and leaves were lavishly put everywhere. Sweets and gifts were distributed. People danced with joy. The whole town echoed with felicitous songs and music. Yeah, big celebration. Maharaji Siddhartha had an inspiration. He called the Prime Minister and said to him, the celebrations of childbirth in the royal family are part of the tradition. However, on this particular occasion, I want something new, something unique. So the minister humbly submitted, Sire, express your wish and it will be carried out like your order. King Siddhartha said, Today announce a general amnesty. Free all the prisoners, write off all the debts, distribute money to the needy, allow 50% subsidy on all purchases from all traders, open centers for distribution of food and clothes to the poor, old and invalid, and liberate old and sick slaves as well. Thus, let the town folk join the celebrations free from misery, hunger, and bondage. Wow, this is a great, great pardon from the king. Great, really great amnesty, yeah. So the order of King Siddhartha was carried out, of course, yeah. <laughs> Who dare not, huh? <laughs> chop, chop. <laughs> the celebrations continued for ten days with unprecedented enthusiasm. People held the occasion and muttered, some divine great soul must have descended on earth to liberate the world from pain and misery. They're talking between each other. <laughs> must be something like that. Otherwise, how can it be such a great magnanimosity and liberation and generosity and all this. When the name given ceremonies approached, King Siddhartha said to Devi Trisla, Devi, there has been a continued increase in our wealth, power and happiness. As such, I think we should name the child as Vatman, Vatman mean ever increasing, always uh, progress, yeah, improved. Queen Trisla consented with joy. Oh, Maharaj, you are absolutely correct. Good wife, good wife. <laughs> this child is certainly going to accelerate our all-around development. Yes. Both of them very happy, so. On the twelfth day after the birth of the child, King Siddhartha organized a great feast again and invited all his relatives and friends. After meals and other state courtesies, King Siddhartha addressed the guests. 
Since the day this child was conceived, our family has been blessed with increasing goodwill, respect, wealth, and mutual affection. Cash, gold, and gems have increased in our treasury. The public has gained health, peace, happiness, and goodwill. Thus, since the moment this soul has descended, there has been a continual enhancement in our glory, wealth, health, and fame. Wow, such a child everyone wants to have, hey? As such, I and Devi Trisla have thought of a befitting name for this child, Vataman. So King Siddhartha's suggestion was unanimously approved and the child was formally named Vataman. Now they are telling the story about his early life. Hmm? Okay. The facts of the early life of Mahavir given in the several biographies, uh, different biographies, yeah? whose names we have recounted above are very few. Mm. Indeed, the later accounts have connected him with certain anecdotes, myths and miracles, but they appear to have been alienated from the other traditional sources and cannot therefore be justifiably recounted as the facts of Mahavira's life. They think some of the uh, biography are too kind of too exaggeratedly mythical, yeah, in content. So they just uh, forget that. Just like not a reliable source, yeah. It's uh, more more exaggerated. It's like just like when people uh, so much respect and revere someone, and they just uh, adding things into their life which has not truly existed. Yeah, so they think they cut it out. There is, for instance, an anecdote in one of the Daigambara books, illustrative of Mahavira's supreme valor, which runs thus. One day, Sakrendra, while talking in the assembly of God, stated, there is no person braver, more courageous, and stronger than Prince Vadiman, the king of the gods in heaven, supposed to say to some subordinate gods like that. Yeah. And the people, uh, they think, you know, maybe the, the author of these books thinking that praising an eight-year-old boy's bravery in the assembly of gods was a strange thing. A skeptic god jokingly said that Sakrendra was exaggerating, and he proceeded to test Prince Vardaman. Oh, here come, <laughs> here come, here come the test. It is possible that the King of God truly was praising uh, the Prince Vardaman. And why not? Just like the Buddha, when he was born, he was only little, but all the gods and the angels and the other saints already surrounding him, bless him and love him. And why not? The god Chakra is supposed to know, to know him, yeah? Because he, he was the one who took uh, Vataman Prince all the way to Mount Meru to bless him and bless him. If such a incredible person or being going to be a great saint and save beings on this planet and even uh, save beings in heavens as well, then of course the kings of God would know even before the birth of the child already. And that's why when the child was born, he was present and took the child up to the Mount Meru to bath in the purest water of the mountain and bless him already. How could he not praise him? In the form of a child, inside already there are godliness, 
already saintliness, yeah, already compassion, mercy, and love. So the God should know, yeah. And if he prays uh, the eight years old kid in the God assembly, I don't think anything wrong about that. I don't think there's nothing rare about that or, or unbelievable about that. Do you? No. You think it's strange? No. No, of course not. Of course not. In uh, the Buddhist Sutra, I think Lotus Sutra, it's recounted that eight years old dragon daughter, yeah, has already became enlightened. Eight years old only, yeah, so why not? The Buddha also know about that. And also praise her or, or tell in front of one of his disciples. I forgot, long time. <laughs> I read this maybe 40 years ago. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, these things are nothing really very extraordinary, huh? In the kingdom of God, or the Buddhas, or the saints, these things are normal. Only for the mortal people, they don't understand, they think, oh, this is not possible. So they doubt the event in heaven, whether or not it really took place. I think it could have taken place. And this is nothing strange. And, and if it's written here, I mean, or in other biography, that means maybe one person, uh, very highly spiritual developed, huh? I could have gone and have access to heaven and probably heard about that or see that. Just like Buddha's disciple uh, or Jesus' disciple or any saint's disciple, they have access to heaven and they can hear discourses or discussion from different goddesses in heaven. So they came back and they wrote it down. So it's nothing really strange. Many of the Buddha disciples also went to many different heavens to listen to Buddha discourses up there. Like when uh, Buddha went to, to Sita heaven to give a lecture on behalf of his mother. Somebody came home, came back and recounted. So it's nothing strange about that. But I guess this is a biography of a great master who has been long gone. Huh? So the people who wrote this or who translated or who maybe uh, gather information about the master, great master, past master, probably uh, not be able to capish that. Okay? <laughs> but you capish, no? Yes. Hmm. I hope. <laughs> no need to even say like uh, the God or the kings of gods even. When I was eight years old, I picked up one of the books or something, a prediction that one child is born in Asia. Uh, right now, uh, that child is about eight years old, and uh, she or he is going to be very great in the world. Uh, no need to be the God to even predict that. They even see it everywhere. There are some seers, you know, great seers, uh, great clairvoyant, who has ability to see things that other people don't see. And not to talk about, no need to talk about uh, a great master. You know, in India or anywhere, there always have been and there always exist some great seers and great clairvoyants all time. Uh, nowadays, even in Tibet, for example, before the 14 Dalai Lama was born, uh, the great seers, the monks, the elder, the senior monks who can see things, who know things, who are trusted, you know, with inner knowledge as well. They went everywhere to look for the child who was supposed to be the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, the next Dalai Lama, which is the 14th Dalai Lama right now. And it's not the first time they do that. They always look for the Dalai Lama reincarnation, uh, you know, different succession. They always did that. And the 14th Dalai Lama also into the same category that they also went everywhere to look for the child. After the Dalai Lama, the past uh, Dalai Lama uh, died, then they will start looking already if the soul of that Dalai Lama has reincarnated somewhere. And they find him. They will always find him and install him back in the throne as the next Dalai Lama. So there is nothing mysterious about uh, whether or not the God, the King of God in heaven has praised uh, 
Prince Vatman when he was only eight years old. I think it's very, very possible that this is really a true story. I mean, why would people say such thing when it's not true? If they understand about spiritual practice and they understand about the precepts, they would not tell lies, especially lying about a master, yeah, a great being like Vatman Mahavira. I think, me think. <laughs> okay, thank you. You all disciples, so all of you always agree to everything I said. This is good. <laughs> Make me feel <laughs> supported. <laughs> but it's logical, right? Yeah, citing so many examples, then you would know that. This is a continue the story that uh, some of the people doubt whether or not it's true. So this is a continuing of that story. So one of the skeptic God uh, in heaven I jokingly said to Sakra that uh, the King of God was exaggerating. So he wanted to test the prince whether or not he's really the bravest, the most courageous <laughs> being or not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> I'm terrified already. <laughs> when the gods of this kind of heaven come down and want to test you, oh, I don't know, you cannot run anywhere. Okay? Even the best spy, the best CIA agent on this planet were to chase you, to hunt you down. You will have more chance to run away than if this god, one of these gods come down and try to catch you. Nowhere to run. You cannot escape. You just have to sit there and have to endure whatever they want to measure upon you. This is terrible. I'm already scared. Yeah. Okay, now this God <laughs> from this heaven, they have specialized, specialized in making trouble for a practitioner. And it's not the prince fault even. He's just only eight years old kid. He did not even say, oh, I'm this, I'm that, I can do this, I can do that, and I want to save the planet, uh, be fast, go read, nothing. <laughs> he didn't do anything. <laughs> it's not his fault. If he grown up already and vowed to save all beings or saying such a great thing like that, then possibly the God should come down and test him. But it's none of their business. I'm telling you, I really don't like these gods at all. They should just mind their own business. In heaven, they have everything they need. They are so happy, joyful. Why do they mess with us? <laughs> we the mortal, we do nothing wrong to them. Ah, never mind, they still want to come down and mess with you. Terrible. So, said and done. This god, not the sacra god, but the the smaller God, maybe subordinate God, yeah? Say to the king that he's going down now to test <laughs> Vatman, just because the king of God praised him. The king of God praised him, not the prince himself. He's only a kid. Oh, see what he's doing, okay? If you're scared, just block your ears. <laughs> now, Vatman, the prince, was playing with children of his age in the... Uh, Chanakan jungle. The game was to race to a target tree, climb up and come down. It's a kid's game, yeah? And get to that tree, whatever the tree they designate, climb up and come down. So easy. Whoever is the first one to reach the ground was the winner. Yeah. Maybe they all climb up together at one time. And then they all come down together, yeah? See who, whoever come down first. Uh, so, Vatman run the race and was first to climb the tree. They probably do the timing. And then the, the boys on the ground saw a ferocious cobra slithering up around the trunk of the tree. The boys see that. You know who that is already, right? You can guess, right? Suddenly a cobra appear from nowhere, huh? and right exactly where the prince was climbing, and hissing and raised his hood. <laughs> the boy started trembling with fear and all run away. Yeah. 
from a safe distance. They run away far away already from the cobra and they shouted to the prince, Batman, do not come down. There's a black serpent on the tree trunk. Don't come down. Batman, already on his way down, saw the snake and also heard the call of his friends. He shouted back, Be quiet, don't be afraid. <laughs> so he jumped down. The snake followed him and hissing and leaped at Batman. Jump at him. Yeah. With astonishing agility, the prince caught the snake by a hood and with a jerk, Throw it away like a piece of rope. <laughs> he cuts him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> As we would thought, huh? Uh, after this, the boys started playing another game. This game called Tindushak. Mm. This game was also a race to a target tree. The winner was to ride piggyback on the losers and return to the base. Yeah, whoever loses have to carry the winner on his back <laughs> and then run all the way with the winner on the back, run, run back to the base. The god who had come to test Vatman also joined the group in disguise uh, as a boy. Okay? In the game, when Vatman won, the god got Vatman on his back and started back to the base. The god suppose, was the loser then, one of the losers, so he has to carry Vatman on his back and run, run back to the base. Yeah. But on the way, he transformed himself into a giant. Ah. With the prince on his back, the god flew into the sky. Big giant carried the prince, flew into the sky. The boys shouted with fear, Vatman! What man? <laughs> but he, the prince, was very undaunted. Hit the giant with his mighty fist. Boom! <laughs> the god cried. <laughs> the, the giant god cried with pain. Probably he know where to hit, no? Nah? <laughs> Maybe here or eyes or whatever. I don't know where he hit, but the god was crying in pain and had to land back on the ground. What man jumped from his back, but the Kubrick disappeared. And in his place appear a god who beg Vatman's forgiveness. <laughs> I like that. I like that very much. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if I should like it because we're not supposed to uh, uh, hit somebody else or anything. But this guy, he deserves it. He messed up, and he's bigger than Vatman. So. I think it's okay. <laughs> if it were me <laughs> on on this uh, giant bag, I would also probably give him some of my kung fu. Yeah, yeah. He he has no business to go there and mess with the kids' game, and then took him to the sky, uh, scaring all the kids like that. Right, bad boy. Mm? So the god came down and then kneel on the floor and and beg the prince to forgive him. Fine, I like that. Now, Indra, I want to test him as well. Oh, there's a next test now. My God, what is this? His life has to be tested all the time. What for? Hmm? Now, in the school, when Vatman entered the ninth year of his age, his parents thought that it was time to impart martial and formal education befitting a Kshatriya boy to him. Kshatriya, the high class of India, and the four class, Kshatriya is the top class, yeah? The class of the warrior, yeah, of royalty. Well, I don't think it's the, the first one. I think the first is Brahman, no? Any India, help me? First is Brahman. Brahman, second is Kshatriya, okay, correct, yeah. Lucky I remember, otherwise he was laughing at me, see that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not Indian, you see, and I know all this since I was younger. And long time, I don't use this kind of knowledge, for what? Yeah, I'm not Indian, uh, and even Indian people are not often 
remember these things. They have many other things to learn nowadays, especially learn computer and stuff. Nobody care about <laughs> Brahma or Shakya or, or whatever the class. But in India, when you go to India, you still have to be mindful of these classes. You don't touch the Brahman class, okay? You don't touch their things. You don't try to go too near to them or utter something that's disrespectful. Even if you go in their kitchen, your shadow is already <laughs> making trouble for you. If you cast your own shadow in their kitchen, for them it means contamination, pollution, yeah, in different kind, uh, spiritually, and they don't like that. So therefore, the prince has to learn martial, not just formal education, but martial art as well, because he's a Shastriya uh, class, okay? Warrior, yeah. They decided to send him to school. So when he went to the school, he offered his respect to the teacher, just like any other ordinary student. In spite of having all worldly knowledge since his birth already, by offering respect to his teacher, Vatman honored the age-old traditional ideals. Even if he know everything already, but he went to school, he must offer respect to his teacher, just the same like every other child. Huh? You maybe prostrate in front of the teacher, maybe one time, two times, three times, depends. And then uh, you make some offering, yeah? That means you accept him as your teacher and you respect him. You prostrate to his feet, yeah? To show respect and obedience, yeah? Uh, many of the Asian countries have this tradition. Uh, maybe nowadays they don't do that anymore. <laughs> but in some area, uh, possible, still have some little tradition left. Remember last year, there was one Vietnamese uh, old man got initiation and he wanted to prostrate to me three times. He, he keep insisting that it's a tradition, Vietnamese tradition. You have to prostrate to your teacher three times. But I said, no, 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 here nobody prostrate to nobody. <laughs> so please don't do that. Uh, he was very reluctantly not doing it. You know, he would have loved to do it with all his heart. I can see that but I don't want to make it into a tradition here. Imagine uh, 1,000 people just got initiation, and then I just sit here for one hour long, <laughs> waiting for, for the prostration to finish. Huh? Understand? <laughs> how, how do I have time to read books for you? I have to read book at home already. Check out if it's worthy to offer it to you. I read other books also, but it was too complicated. So I did not bring it here, I bring this, this one. It's a very good book, it's simple, even child and adult can enjoy it. Yeah, and I don't have to explain a lot. All I do is just know how to read English, <laughs> simple. <laughs> so nowadays maybe we cut that, yeah? But in the Buddha's time, they still do that, no? And whenever any of the students wanted to ask Buddha some question, a Buddha time, it is written in the sutra, but I guess in every other tradition in India, you know, uh, about Buddha's time, or nowadays even, they still prostrate to the guru, to the master, when they want to ask something, or they, when they first came in to greet him, when they came to, they came visit, not just the first time, but whenever they can visit the master, they bow to the master, and whenever they take leave, they do the same. I think we better not do anything, because if I let him do it, then everybody else would like to do it. And knowing you, you will take your time, and you will keep looking, and you, you try to do it very slowly, <laughs> one extra bow and two extra bow, and then, my God, it will take forever. <laughs> even, even I respect traditions, and it's not a bad tradition, but logistically speaking, <laughs> it's, it's not practical, okay, huh? Yeah, I know many of you also want to do that. You keep asking me, but no, okay? No is no, and no, no. <laughs> we don't need this kind of respect. We respect inside, okay? We respect by keeping the precept, by being vegan, uh, 
by meditating diligently, yeah, and really trying to uh, abide by the master teaching and try to go home. That is a real respect. Outer respect, anybody can do. Inside respect is harder, yeah? I want the inside respect. Huh? And uh, the proof of the respect, not just bowing on the floor, anybody can do that. But believe me, after I die, they probably make a statue out of me and put me somewhere, and then people will still come bowing, because that time I cannot forbid them. <laughs> I cannot say anything. <laughs> Right, so the teacher gave him the first lesson of the alphabet. Vatsman listened silently. After some time, the teacher called him and asked, Prince, you are just idling. Why don't you repeat the lesson and try to memorize it? Yeah. The same like my father told me when I was young. Why don't you ever study anything at home? I say, I know it already by heart, so I read it to him, and then he believed to me, yes. I read without a book, yeah? Without a book. Mm. So in reply, Vartman recited the full alphabet for the teacher. The teacher was very, very surprised. While he was trying to fathom the surprising capacity of the little boy, an old man, an old Brahmin, with a tilak on his forehead. Yeah, you know tilak, right? Yeah, in India people, they, they put some red dot in front of your forehead here, between the eyebrow, a little bit up. Good idea, no? That was a tradition before. The teacher would have put something here, yeah? So that the disciple always remember the third eye. So they remind each other, huh? Or when they look in the mirror, seeing the telak in front of the forehead, they would not forget where to concentrate. Yeah, it's a good idea. Everything you know of value <laughs> is inside you. So whatever I told you outside, is I told you already, it's just past time, no? It's a <laughs> worldly knowledge. Whatever truly divine knowledge is imparted to you without language, without words. So you have that already, yeah? And every time you come to see me, I just entertain you. Mm? <laughs> so now we continue with the prince. Uh, so uh, the teacher was very surprised and was trying to really understand <laughs> the magnitude of this boy uh, intelligence and capacity. So there was one old, old Brahmin with the tilak on his forehead entered the school yeah, one day. The teacher greeted him and offered a seat. The Brahmin asked some complex question on grammar. The teacher could not reply and remained silent, looking down in shame. Mm. He cannot answer. Yeah. So the Brahmin smiled and said, Acharya, please do not bother yourself, I mean teacher, don't worry, you know. Maybe uh, I will ask this a little new student of yours, <laughs> maybe he can solve my problem. Uh, if you allow me, may I ask him? The prince, yeah. So the teacher consented and the old Brahman uh, put the complex questions before Vardaman. Yeah. Little Vatiman, without hesitating, gave correct and appropriate answers. The teacher stared dumbfounded at the little boy. The Brahman smiled and said, Acharya, I mean teacher, please Acharya, don't feel insulted. You are not aware that the sun of knowledge of this era is present before your very eyes as Prince Vardaman. He is the future Lord Mahavir Swami, the omniscient. I mean, nothing he cannot do. <laughs> so, it is believed that Indra compiled his questions and Vardaman's answers into a book named Indra uh, Vyadaran. I mean the grammar of the Indra. 
Indra is another god, yeah? Maybe lower than uh, Chakra, but also very powerful, okay? He's lower than Chakra, right? Or higher? A huh? lot of rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lower than the uh, Chakra. But he is still very powerful, also capable of testing. <laughs> Beware of all these goddesses. They are not always very friendly. I don't know why they are so scared of us practitioners. I mean the real practitioners will be always tested since little already, with all kind of things, maybe centipede bites or, or some sickness or some kind of scary situation and uh, family trouble, you know. Uh, when you were little already, they already test you how you solve this family problem for your parents even, when parents are helpless how you help them also. Uh, I, I had also some cases like that. Yeah. So they even compile these questions and answers into a book, yeah? I mentioned already. Okay, this is two goddesses have tested uh, Vardaman, yeah, two. But these are nothing. These tests are nothing, believe me, compared to the one that Lord Mahavira had to endure afterward in his adult life and in his ascetic life, seeking the truth. The more determined you are to help humankind, or help all beings, the more tests you will have to undergo. And not everyone passed the test. That's why we don't have many masters. Because some tests are very, very severe, above human endurance and intellect and capacity. Okay, now they are talking about Mahavira's family. Okay, we will finish that, and tomorrow we will talk about his life as a monk, okay? Ascetic monk. Not just normal monk, but ascetic monk, extremely ascetic, yeah. After you heard the story about his asceticism, you feel very, very lucky and grateful to be able to sit here on a soft cushion and a clean floor and have a roof and have aircon and fan and whatever. Nowadays, in India, people still practice asceticism like that. I saw many of them. Uh, maybe not the same as the Lord Mahavira, but I'm just telling you some of the ascetic uh, style that the monks in India practice, like the sitting on the nail bed, okay, without flinching, without moving. I think if you want to cure your problem, <laughs> maybe you try that. <laughs> because it hurts so much, you will not be able to close your eyes <laughs> or move, okay? The more you move, the more it hurts. And after a while, they, their mind is so strong that even the nails won't pinch their body, yeah? So strong, a, a practice, yeah? But until then, I'm not sure how many holes they already uh, have on their body, yeah? Just like in Taiwan or China or Asian, they practice Qigong, huh? And they can lay on top of broken glass and somebody even punch them on it and still nothing, no, nothing hurt them. The glass will fall off their skin just like some baby powder, yeah? Uh, yeah, I saw that. Or if somebody uh, put a, a spear sharp into their throat here, this is the most sensitive area, no? Put it here. And somebody push it, you know, one or two or many people push it, depends on how strong the practitioner. And the, the spear will bend, you know? <laughs> but their throat just have a little red, a red color, a little bit red, like you scratching, that's all, nothing happening to them. Yeah, that's uh, practicing Qigong. In our, in our group, there are some people also like that. 
Yeah, they did in front of me. Before, when I don't have a lot of you, <laughs> and uh, me and the, the long-term resident, one of them also <laughs> performed this act. Yeah, It's probably recorded somewhere. Just for fun, huh? Mm. <laughs> and I also show off sometimes, you know, like I lay down very flat on the bed or just on the table. And I dare a big, strong boy come and lift me up if he can. Cannot. Long time ago. I don't test now. I'm not sure. Long time. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. A, one of the residents, very strong, he cannot lift me up. Maybe he just pretend he cannot, so <laughs> make me happy. <laughs> but many times he tried. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, that guy is still alive, huh? The the one Qi Kong that lay on broken glass, you know, real glass, and being even pressed down, is still alive, huh? And uh, the one I put the spear on him, and it doesn't doesn't hurt him, but the spear bend, yeah? It's still alive, huh? I make them use their muscle power and chicken power to, to do woodsmith instead, you know, making lamb and stuff like that. <laughs> making use of their power into something more practical, yeah? Nowadays, it's very, very, very impossible, very, very uh, unthinkable that somebody would go and push him down on the broken glass ever or even use a spear to threaten him in the throw anymore. So I say, use that, use the muscle <laughs> and the talent to make something more, <laughs> more uh, useful. <laughs> and I have some Qigong master like that, you know, and some other kind of Kung Fu master also within our group, within the resident group. Outside, you know, your brother and sister, I'm sure there are many more different kind of talents. Uh, I have maybe magical power, they can chop wood, no need knife, it's very economy. <laughs> you buy a wood <laughs> for fire, tell him, just chop it. <laughs> you no need to buy any axe or anything. There are some people like that, yeah. And some of your brother, or at least one that I knew, can chop a small stone. Small stone is more difficult to chop, you know? You chop the bricks, it's more easy. Yeah. Well, not for me, of course, but more easy because <laughs> it's bigger and it has more uh, holes inside. Eh? But the small, compact stone from the riverbed, round and small like this, very difficult to break. Now, one of your brother could, yeah. I saw it. <laughs> it probably also records some older, older video tape, you still can see it. Yeah, we may have, we have muscle around, eh? So now, uh, they talk about Mahavir's family. I told you I have calendar, no? <laughs> I mean, talk a lot <laughs> in between. Okay, continue. The Chinat clan to which King Siddhartha belonged was same as the Isvasku clan to which Lord Rishabdev belonged. So Siddhartha and Rishabdev both belonged to the Kashyap family. These people, these two families, are very proud that 22 Tirthankas came from the same family. Yeah. Mother Trishla was the sister of Chitak, the president of the Vaishali Republic. Because of the parental connection with Vide area, she was also known as Vidyahadatta Dina. Her third name was Priyakarini. Vatma's uncle, or King Siddhartha's younger brother, was Supasva. Siddhartha's eldest son was Nandi Vadan. Oh, don't ask me what's all this name. I just read Indian name, yeah? Probably some important personage. Nadivadan's wife was Jesatha. Vatiman also had a sister named Sudarshana. When and to whom Sudarshana was married is not mentioned anywhere. Probably not important. 
However, her son, Jamali, was a famous figure. Although surrounded by unlimited wealth and grandeur, Prince Vataman's mind and attitude was completely detached and purified by the fire of discipline. It was like a lotus flower in the pond. The power and glory of the kingdom never attracted him. Even his marriage to Yashoda, daughter of Prince Samavir, was due to the affectionate persuasion and pressure by and from his parents. You know, arranged marriage. Yeah. Yashoda gave birth to a daughter. Even though he was married, he was not really attached to all that. So there is a difference between having things and attached to it. Or not having things, but attached to it. So there were two different ways of attachment and two different ways of detachment. Like uh, one time, there was one very great yogi who was invited to a, a very rich person banquet, or maybe even royalty. And he, he just put everything in one dish, and he stared it all up, 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 he stared it all the time, stared all the time. And the host of the party was thinking, this man is so rude. He doesn't taste one by one, and normally if you're invited somewhere, you taste some and some, and you say, oh, this is good and that's good, to please the host as well, you know, as a manner, yeah. But he don't care, he put everything in, and he keeps staring it. He not even eat it. So the host, the, the lady host, was very angry, said, what kind of man is this yogi? He's supposed to be very uh, greatly enlightened, but he has no manner. Why does he keep doing that? He don't even enjoy our food. It's all delicacy. Prepare for him and other guests as well. But he just put them all together, like, like he has no manner and no knowledge of the high society, you know, of the food and of the taste, and he has absolutely no etiquette, no politeness, yeah? He's very rude. So one of his maybe friend or similar yogi class explained to the host, say, if he doesn't do that, then he will be in samadhi, <laughs> he will not even be awake to attend your party. Yeah. He has to occupy himself, do something. <laughs> so, he put all the food there, but doesn't mean that he wants to eat them. Mm? Okay, he just do it. And like sometime you, uh, some of your sister, or maybe some of you or anybody would criticize some former king, like he has many wives, but I explained to you already, it's a duty only. He does that as tradition for his country. Also to try to have as many prince and princesses as possible, help him run his kingdom when he's older, or to marry off somewhere else so that they will strengthen a relationship between his nation and the neighboring countries. And mostly, King, they don't even know who's going to be in his bed that night even. They just give him a lot of cards and he just pick one. And whoever the name is written on it, then will, it, will be his company that night. He like it or not like. It's better he doesn't like any, because if he likes one, then other wives will be jealous. Because mostly these wives are from ministers and from, or from neighboring country. So he cannot favor any of them above the rest. That will make his kingdom shaky, yeah, and endanger his nation. So that is a kind of uh, detachment also, I think. He just fulfills his duty. Uh, many stories we read in, for example, Chinese tradition or Vietnamese tradition. If a king favors one of his concubines, then there's always some war or some trouble afterward, and the king would die, and concubine die, or lost the kingdom. Yeah, you know, right? Hmm? Chinese especially. So here it's explained that even the Lord Mahavira was married to 
one of the princess here, royal family members, but he's also not interested. If he's not interested in the whole kingdom, why would he be interested in one woman? Because if he became a king, he could have many women, many concubines. Therefore, even if he's married and he is not attached, then it's very, very easy for us to understand, very easy. Just like Prince Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, he has uh, also many concubines. He has only one wife, but many concubines. Concubines mean uh, also wives, <laughs> it's a different degree. Yeah. I mean, he can choose any of them also. Yeah. They are in waiting, like wife in waiting. So he also married and even have a son also, but he also left afterward to be an ascetic, yeah? And later, Lord Mahavira also will do the same. The story is very similar. It's, it's very surprisingly similar. Also prince, and also rich and famous and well and intelligent and strong and handsome and even married and have a kid and still forsook everything just to go seek the truth in all possible hard way. Yeah. Okay, so he, he married this princess named Yashoda. Buddha, before he became Buddha, he married to Yajudala. Sounds similar name, eh? Yes. <laughs> this is Yashoda. And Yashoda gave birth to a daughter who was named Priyadashana. Prince Jamali married Priyadashana. They married the clan, they married each other. According to Akaran Sutra, three names of Vardaman became very famous. Vardaman, his parents gave this name, yeah? And Saman, Saman, or Shaman. Uh, indicate his natural unblemished intellect. Second name. The third name is Mahavir. This indicates his unique bravery, courage, and tolerance. The gods gave him this name. The gods gave him this name. <laughs> my name, Supreme Master, is not given by my parents. Also, heavens gave to me. And that name gave me a lot of trouble, not that I really like to pin it on my chest. Everybody said, what? Supreme Master, who are you? <laughs> who are you? Call yourself Supreme Master. <laughs> they ask all the time. So one time, I say, yeah, why not? I'm the Supreme Master. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Remember? <laughs> Another of his names was Sanmati. Because of his purity of thought, he also became famous by his name, by this name. Yes. Other names of Lord Mahavir Swami found in canonical literature are as follows. Chanatputra, Vaishlik, Vir, Ativya, Antia, Kashyap, etc. He has many names. I guess Buddha also has many names, meaning title, yeah? He has many names, not because he wants many names, uh, meaning titles, yeah? The people call the Buddha, world honor one, perfect a heart, a Buddha, <laughs> or a great king also, like that. Detached from all mundane activities and desires of becoming an ascetic. In order to pursue the spiritual goal, Mahavir was keeping the matter pending due to his earlier resolution. As long as my parents are alive, I shall not think of taking diksha. You know what diksha is? Huh? Vows to be monk, something like that. So when Mahavir became 28 years old, his parents took the last vow of continued meditation without food. In India, in those times, maybe still now, the people who practice uh, 
spiritual, they take many vows, yeah? Like for example, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, the, the monks and nuns take many vows, yeah, but at one time. And the lay people, sometimes they take five vows, only precepts, yeah? And other want to uh, practice harder, they take like eight vows, yeah? Or ten vows, yeah? And etc., etc. And uh, at that time, at the Mahavira time, there are the last vows that you can take. Meaning, when you are near your older age and you are near death or something that you know maybe you are going to leave the world soon, you take the last vow. The last vow is that you don't eat anything until you die. You just meditate, pray, meditate, pray, no food, no drink. So the parents took their last vows when uh, Mahavir was 28 years of age, and then they died. Before that, of course, they gradually purified their souls and left their mortal bodies with a serene mental state. After their death, Vatman told his elder brother, now the elder brother became King Nadivatan. He told his brother, the king, the successor of his father, Nadivadan. He told him that he wanted to become an ascetic. Uh, not normal monk only, but ascetic monk is harsher, yeah, more disciplined, more determined, okay, to get the goal. A normal monk, maybe just a follow Buddha, take some precepts and just a very regular regular kind of life. But ascetic monks, different. They're really harsh for themselves. Like in India, I saw many monks, they sit under the hot sun of the hottest summer days, with fire even around them, and looking at the sun, same time. That is one of their penance, one of their ascetic practice. And some practice forsaking everything, including their own clothing, that they don't even wear any clothes. They use ash to cover their skin, okay? And some ascetic monks sit on the nail bed, really sharp nail bed to meditate. And some standing on one leg to meditate. Some standing on the head for a long period of time, non-stop. Some bury themselves under the ground, uh, practicing a uh, deep kind of very long uh, interval of breathing. But don't do that, okay? These are special, special technique you have to learn, and you have to practice long, long before you can do that. You know, you go into kind of a, a hibernating state, hmm? And you breathe once every long, 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 long while, or you don't breathe for a long time. Don't do that, eh? Okay? <laughs> Many techniques you can learn, but doesn't mean you can practice. Learning and practicing are different things. Just like some people, uh, same class, and st learn the same, with the same teacher to speak English, but some speak very well English, some could not. The ability is different. Some people also, uh, you know, like the, the yogi, they, they grow their hair very long like this, yeah, long, long, very long, and they braid them together. Uh, they never cut, they never wash them, just they braid them together and just wash with water, just rinse. And they hang their hair on a tree branch or something, just standing, so they're standing there like that all the time, or sitting like that all the time, to avoid you know, sleeping. I see all of you cut your hair short, that's a very wise thing to do. <laughs> Otherwise, you might tempt you to hang yourself. <laughs> so many ascetism people practice. Some like they don't eat for a long time, or once every two, three days, or only eat when some people feed them. If nobody feed them, they don't touch any food, they don't touch any drink. It's like that. Somehow they're trying to trim themselves in any way they can, 
so, so that they can detach more and more things, detach from them, so that they can be more concentrate on the goal of finding God. So that's their way of finding God. Different people try different way. <laughs> there was one story in India, I remember. There was one man, he passed by one yogi, and that yogi was kind of hanging himself with a rope, with a strong rope on, on the tree, yeah? And then just hanging there. And the, the person passed by and asked, what are you doing? Yeah. And that yogi said, I'm hanging in there just so I can find God. Yeah. So the man said, really? Hanging yourself there? Can find God? Okay, good. Then he go and try and find some, some uh, simple grass or something and he said, bind them together and also hang himself <laughs> very high. And of course the rope broke because it's not professionally done. It's not a real rope. It just bind the grasses together and hang himself up hoping to find God. And the rope broke. But then he fell down and then God just got hold of him. And of course then he saw God, eh? he, <laughs> he realized God. And then the other guy with the strong rope binding forever, they said, that's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair. He, he just came, he just hang a few minutes and you got hold of him like that. Why didn't you ever touch me or let me even see you? God said, well, you are too considerate of yourself. You bind yourself with such a big rope. This guy, he's so eager. He didn't consider his life or security, nothing. He just gets some grass and hang himself up. He's too sincere. I, I have to rescue him. <laughs> it's like that. Just like one of the Zen story, yeah? One of the disciples want to, to see Buddha nature so desperately uh, that he say he had to uh, practice day and night, eating once a day and kneeling on the floor and bowing a thousand times a day, whatever, yeah? reciting Buddha's name or one ten million times, whatever. And the Master said, useless. Yeah, because he asked, why I don't see any Buddha nature, I don't see any light. Master said, useless. What you're doing is all wrong. It's from the heart, it's not like that. So the disciple asked him, how is it from the heart? Show me. How can I do it from the heart? So the Master put his head down in the water and the disciple, oh! <laughs> Get me out, okay? And the Master say, that is from the heart. If you really want a Buddhahood, a Buddha nature, as desperately as if you are drowning in the water, like just now, then that is from the heart. Then you will get it. I guess all of you are not from the heart, that's why you sit here, right? <laughs> I also sit here, so don't worry, we all sit here together. <laughs> Why was I talking so much? <sighs> ah, okay, okay, now we go back to Prince Vatman, it's more interesting. After his parents went away to heaven, he told his elder brother, who is the king now, he said that he wants to become an ascetic monk, he wants to forsake everything, go away, yeah. So Nadivadan replied in a choking voice, choking voice, he's emotional, yeah. He said, what, prince, brother, we just lost our parents, and now you want to leave me as well, to be a renunciate. How will I be able to bear these shocks at the same time? The brother is more emotional, <laughs> more human. <laughs> the prince is, is not human, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> He's above humans. He, he doesn't uh, seem to be attached even to emotion, family or anything, anything he forsake. So he begged his younger brother, Vataman, please honor my desire. The new king said, honor my desire, please. And Postpone your program for two years. <laughs> your program, he said. <laughs> mean, don't become an ascetic monk just yet. Stay with me 
for another two years. I guess so he has somebody with him, you know, somebody close. Because parents just left and now brother also leave him. And he has just become a king, you know, a new king. Many things he has to learn, many things he has to take care. Many things he has to handle as a young king. It's, it's a lot for him without any support, supporting love beside him. So he begged him to stay for another two years. So of course, Prince Vardaman, you know, has no heart to refuse. So he accepts his elder brother's request and stay back for two more years. But during this period, he lived like an ascetic already, yeah, indulging in spiritual practices with due discipline. He prepared himself for his impending renunciation. Knowing about his resolve for renunciation, gods from the edge of the universe arrived and put forth the formal request. Now, the gods come down and ask him something. They ask him thus, O oh, benefactor of the world, your resolve is great. Please proceed on the path of renunciation and propagate religion for the welfare of the world. Oh, they did not... Uh, they did not ask, they just request them to do that, supporting him by telling him, okay, go ahead. So Prince Vardaman gave charity three hours every day for one year long. Rich or poor, whoever came to Vardaman was awarded whatever he desired. At the end of one year, Vardaman was ready for renunciation. Okay. That is that for now, eh? Tomorrow I read you more, huh? Thank you for listening. So I let you meditate, huh? <laughs> All this way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Buddha said there is, there are 84,000 way of practice, right? We can add a few more <laughs> for my disciples. <laughs> the left way of meditation, <laughs> the right way and the front, and also the back. <laughs> so that makes 88,000. <laughs> okay, good night then. Good story, yeah? Yes. See you. Thank you. Okay? Wisdomoto 不过等个五十岁不一定还活着是吗 那个就是普通的和尚, 我年轻就当和尚, 我不是那种, <笑> 
修行吗？如果他们普通的、普通的和尚、普普通的呃男孩子都这样啊，要等那个结婚啊，然后负责任啊，小孩长大了，然后才离离家。我觉得那个传统是不错了，不过我们怎么知道什么时候死呢？是吗？哎呀，有没有人写那个保证书说 OK， 你七十岁再往生？七十岁了，七十现在七十四了吗？八十四，哇 ，Mansion g a m 的，哇，在德国他们。他们什么惊讶？他这么说这样 ，mansion g i n 的，没什么意思。嗯，跟我们台湾人说，哇塞，这样子，八十四了，哦，看起来不差哈。你们两个看起来都不老，我认识他们已经三十多年了，看起来跟以前差不多，哎，修行蛮不错，才对，不错。嗯、哇。你们还活着，我也很高兴。<笑>看到几个老朋友嘛，他也是啊。<笑>哎呀，不然的话都是都是那个新的，然后我不认识，懂不懂？这些护法如果他们护法衣服脱掉，我不认识，啊，我认不出来。<笑>啊，没有几只啊，啊，别的都好像。走了，啊，老的、硬性的同修不多，那个时候很小，嗯，怎么还还对师傅信心到现在还不变呢？啊？为什么？风波那么多，是不是啊？<笑>不会啦，不会，永远真诚。<笑>对了，我知道了。不过一直说风波那么多嘛，懂不懂？哎，名誉不好，还是跟着。嗯 ，OK， 继续了。嗯，八十多岁还这么这么强壮，厉害。他是到家了，到世了，不是普通了。有另外一个道道长，他离开了，那个人神通很厉害，嗯，这些人呢会看脸的，呵呵算是不看好算好，生辰日子是是不是真的名字才来的，所以，宝<笑>贝都博好了，八卦都看好，嗯，所以八风吹不动，我教他们几个是八风吹不动。哈，哈哈哈哈哈，要等我哈，哈哈。OK，Thank you 哈，大家。